your trespasses and sin in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Lord God, we do desire to give you all power and all glory and all honor in our lives. Lord, we desire to lift up your name and to praise you, Lord. We know that we were children of wrath. How terrifying to be under the wrath of God. And yet you, through your grace, gave us the gift of faith. Faith in your Son, whom you put on the cross to die for our sins. That we might receive forgiveness and that we might receive his righteousness, Lord. A righteousness that comes from outside ourselves, Lord. Not something that we could conjure up, but something that we had to be given. Lord, we just praise your name. We're amazed at your love for us. We desire to glorify you and to live by your name. We desire to do that in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing, uh, go back to the 15th century. Martin Luther wrote this hymn. And this hymn was a battle cry for the Protestants, for the Christian pilgrim, for the Christian martyr, for the royalty. Uh, this was a song that they would sing constantly as a reminder that as we go through struggles and frustrations and all the spiritual warfare that we encounter every moment of every day, that, this, that our God is a mighty fortress, that he is our refuge and our strength. And so uh, we're going to sing a mighty fortress is our God.
Romans chapter 9, we come to the end of the journey of this chapter, one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible, not so much to comprehend, but the doctrine in it is uncomfortable for us at times as we think through it and the implications of it and how the, that those doctrines integrate with other doctrines of Scripture and then make their way into our lives. It's a difficult chapter. But in Romans 9, verses 30 through 33, all that's left for Paul is to tie up one loose end. We'll talk about that and we'll come out clear. The title of the message this morning is Israel's Problem and Ours. Israel's Problem, which is the same problem that we have. It's going to be a little bit different this morning. We're going to come at this slightly differently because I want to give you some good, solid background material without which I don't think it's possible to understand this passage the way Paul intended it. So sit back and relax for a moment. We'll get to the text shortly. Put your finger on Romans 9. And as you're putting your finger on Romans 9, go ahead and look for Isaiah chapter 8. We'll begin there in just a moment. You know, God made many promises to Old Testament Israel. Two of the great ones being an eternal dynasty and a kingdom that knows no bounds. Those were two of the big ones. Throughout this letter that we know as Romans, Paul has emphasized those promises in the Old Testament, and specifically those two big ones, were made not to Old Testament Israel, but to the remnant of faithful believers within Old Testament Israel. Paul made that clear in the in the about the fourth verse of chapter nine. But also they are accessed by those outside of Old Testament Israel altogether. And that was the shocking part, the surprising part for the Jewish listener who is hearing this letter read for the very first time. They were available, those promises, to anyone who is justified by faith in Christ. Of course, this would have surprised Jewish people. So Paul points out one last time in this set of verses, 30 through 33, that the Old Testament Israelites, the Jews, if you will, were trusting in themselves more than they were trusting in God or His Son, for that matter. And really, that is our problem today, too, isn't it? How often do we fall into the trap of trying to be perfect, just like the Jews, rather than resting in His grace? How many times do we find ourselves trusting uh, or trying to please God rather than walking in the joy of our salvation? Too often, I'm afraid. We don't mean to, but we quickly fall into the same trap of trusting more in ourselves than we do in Him. The great trap, the bear trap. These verses point out that error, both in Israel and in us. So, let me speak for a moment of Paul's use of Isaiah, the prophet. Paul appeals to Isaiah in our passage. And the Jewish people would have known exactly what he was appealing to. And he appeals to Isaiah to impress upon Jewish listeners this idea. Stop working and start trusting. Stop working and start trusting. Really to grasp the force of Paul's point, you need to understand Isaiah's context. That's why I had you turn to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah prophesied to the kingdom of Israel after it had been split into northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And that's important to know. Isaiah prophesied for 50 years to the southern kingdom that judgment was coming. Judgment is coming. 50, 50 years. Same message. And ultimately that judgment came albeit in stages. Assyria to the north of the northern kingdom carried away the northern kingdom first. That occurred in about 722 B.C. And then 
and Babylon rose up and finished off the southern kingdom over a hundred years later. Isaiah, for his part, he lived to see the northern kingdom be taken away, but he died before Jerusalem was destroyed. And this is important. Here's the important point. You look at Isaiah's book. I think it's 66 chapters. His book of prophecies is basically split into three sections. The first five chapters are prophecies of physical judgment. The middle chapters state the reason why. Israel must be purified, though God preserved for himself a remnant. And then the latter chapters, beginning about Isaiah chapter 28, all the way to the end, speak of the future restoration of Israel, of God's people. Paul, in Romans 9, 10, and 11, follows that framework. In other words, in Romans 9, he lays out spiritually that the Old Testament Israel has been rejected by God. In Romans 10, he states the reason why, uh, that God has preserved for himself a remnant while the Jewish nation is being purified, a remnant who believes by faith, of course. And then... In Romans 11, he speaks of the future restoration of Israel. So Romans 9 through 11, in some ways, is the Cliff Notes version of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, don't do what I did when I was in school and just read the Cliff Notes. Go back and read the real thing. It's so much, it's so much more uh, comprehensive and gives you a better understanding. But if you want to know what Isaiah is saying, Romans 9 through 11 is a, is a good outline. In our passage, understanding that framework, Paul conflates two Isaiah passages, 8.14, which we'll look at, and 28, verse 16. Both of them make the same point. Stop working, start trusting. And I'm going to tell you beforehand so you can follow and track with me. Chapter 8, he's speaking to the northern kingdom and addressing their misfortune misdeeds. Chapter 28, he's speaking to the southern kingdom, and Paul is going to relate that to the Jews in his day when we come back to Romans. So let's look at chapter 8, verse 14. Here's, here's the setting. The northern kingdom formed an alliance with powerful Syria. And if we have that map, we can throw it up on the screen. It may help us just as a frame of reference. But the northern kingdom had formed an alliance with powerful Assyria, who was to the north. The northern kingdom being in green on the screen, Israel. Sometimes it's called Ephraim, which was one of the northern tribes. Sometimes it's called Damascus, which was the capital. Um, but the northern kingdom had formed this alliance with powerful Syria, because Syria was rising and threatening them. So they enter into a, an alliance. King Ahaz of the southern kingdom... Judah, it's red on our screen or crimson for Alabama fans. Uh, it's sometimes called Jerusalem because Jerusalem is in Ju uh, Judah, the southern kingdom. Sometimes called Zion because Zion was a hill in Jerusalem. But King Ahaz was the king and he refused to join in with them. So what happened is Isaiah warned the northern kingdom that Assyria would soon carry them away and encroach upon the southern kingdom as well. Human alliances and hand-wringing were common as both kingdoms, north and south, began to try to work their way politically out of certain doom. These great, huge nations, world powers, really, were coming, and they were trying to align and, and form treaties and have axes of good, and uh, it, it didn't work. Isaiah's message is simple. If you want to escape the doom, put complete trust in the Lord. That's the only way. That's the only way. And really, I'll, I'll pause as a parenthetical. This is not the main point. But in our current condition in, as a country today, we are not a theocracy. We are not a nation that was created by God, for God, and governed by God. But amid sieges and riots and all the rest, we've tried everything humanly possible, but 
that no one's placing their trust in the Lord. No one is putting themselves at the throne of His grace and turning all things over to Him. So Isaiah rightly predicts only a remnant, namely, he and his disciples will actually do that, and he was right, it turned out. For the rest of the people, the Lord becomes a rock they trip over while running wildly, trying to escape destruction through political maneuverings, through human efforts. And in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14, is where Paul fixes his attention. But I want to read the context, verses 13 through 18. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he will become a sanctuary, and a stone of offense, and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, both houses being northern kingdom and southern kingdom, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. The house of Jacob being both kingdoms, north and south. He's hiding his face from national Israel. And I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs or portents, that's foreshadowings, in Israel for the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. So Isaiah speaks of God as both a sanctuary and a rock of stumbling, a sanctuary for those who place their faith in Him and they can flee into a, a, a resting place. And a stone of stumbling, or he calls it a rock of offense to those who are running around wildly trying to fix the problem on their own. What do they do? They trip over the stone that they can't see because their eyes are fixed on all of these other things. And that's the message. Stop working and start trusting. That was... Old Testament Israel's problem in Isaiah's day regarding physical judgment, and it was Israel's problem in Paul's day regarding spiritual judgment. And then Paul also quotes Isaiah 28, verse 16. Now that you understand the, the context, uh, we'll, we won't spend as much time with this one, but if you'll flip to Isaiah 28, verse 16, this is all going somewhere, so I, I really need you to track with me uh, just this one Sunday. It's going to require you to stay focused, and if you didn't take your Ridlin, and if you have ADD, then I'll give you just a moment to take it, because, you know, we're almost there. Just, just stick with me. So, we've learned a lesson about the Northern Kingdom, right? They didn't listen, and they were taken away. Now, Isaiah fixes his attention on the Southern Kingdom in chapter 28. And look, at, look at what he does. The southern kingdom, which was tiny, began to feel threatened. And so what they do is they run over to the south and the west to Egypt. And they make a treaty with Egypt. We need your protection. And they make a, a covenant with them. In fact, Isaiah calls it a covenant of death. Why? Because they made the same mistake as the northern kingdom. They tried to fix this thing on their own, and they actually ran to a pagan nation on whom God had exercised his judgment so magnificently in the book of Exodus, through the plagues and all the rest. They rejected God's protection in lieu of Egypt's soldiers and wealth and horsemen and chariots. Poor substitute for God's protection. That's what they did. It was the final nail in their coffin, the covenant of death. And here again, they attempted to do it through their own works. Look at Isaiah 28, verses 16 and 17. He documents it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion. Zion being 
southern kingdom, the hill in Jerusalem. A stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. And waters will overwhelm the shelter. He says, critically, he says, whoever believes will not be in haste. That's from the Masoretic text. That's the actual words that Isaiah wrote. The Greek translation of those words read this way. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And that's the specific translation that Paul quotes when we get over to Romans. But it's saying the same thing. Stop working and believe, trust, rest in the fact that God is sovereign and His grace is sufficient. No matter what happens, they wouldn't do it. So Paul's ultimate conclusion is this. The, the northern kingdom trusted in their own efforts to their own demise. The southern kingdom had benefit of watching that all play out and they followed the same pattern. They trusted in their own efforts to their own demise. The Jews in Paul's day to whom he is writing had the benefit of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and they learned nothing. They followed the same pattern. They tried to save themselves spiritually through their own efforts and it was to their own demise. Isaiah's words just jump out. Justice is the line and righteousness is the plumb line, not human effort. You can't negotiate your way out of this. You can't work your way out of this. If justice is the line, righteousness is the plumb line. The only way to escape destruction, ancient Israel, New Testament Israel, Israel today, you and I, the only way out of this is to stop working, admit your unrighteousness, and fling yourselves upon the mercies of God. It's the only formula. Today, people are running wildly trying to make themselves righteous while spiritual destruction is marching closer and closer and closer and closer. And, closer. and the closer it marches, the, the more wildly they run around. That's Paul's frame of reference. So knowing that Old Testament context from which he's coming, now we come to the actual text itself. I said, boy, this sermon's going to be a long one. No, we're almost done. All we have to do now is connect the dots, right? Paul has two points in this message. It's the same two points of Isaiah. Number one, stop working. Stop working. Verses 30 and 31. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. The key verb used twice is pursue. Obviously, it means chase after or run after. It's a graphic verb, especially in light of Old Testament Israel and what you know about them. They were running after man-made ways, political ways to solve the problem. And, and in Paul's day, they were running after the law, man-made ways to solve their spiritual problem. Paul begins to distinguish between two things that the people are chasing after. One group is chasing after what, what I call faith-based righteousness. Paul calls it a righteousness that is by faith. And the other group is chasing after a works-based righteousness, or Paul's words, a law that would lead to righteousness. So I want to talk real quickly about those two. Faith-based righteousness. We call this imputed righteousness, or alien righteousness, in the sense that it's alien to us, it comes from outside of us, and comes into us. That this is a righteousness that we spoke of in detail in Romans chapter 4 with Abraham. He had a righteousness that was imputed unto him. 
the Gentiles did not, Paul says, did not chase after works-based righteousness. No, the Gentiles realized rather quickly they could never catch it. They realized they were imperfect, they were pagans, they had, had years of a track record of being imperfect. So the last thing that they did was to chase after perfection. They recognized rather quickly they needed the righteousness of someone else. They needed an alien righteousness in order to be justified before God. And Paul calls this a righteousness by faith. It's received by faith alone in Christ alone such that all Christ has becomes theirs, becomes ours, becomes yours, and becomes mine if you believe by faith. What about works-based righteousness? Martin Luther called this civil righteousness in the sense of a civil servant who does the right thing and he's a good citizen. And, and, and works-based righteousness is this false notion that a sin-filled man can earn God's favor by working his way out of his sinfulness. This was Israel's problem. Israel chased after a law that would lead to righteousness. Some versions... King James and ASB say the law of righteousness, same thing. They run to and fro following this law and that one thinking they can overcome their sinful nature by their own merits. It won't happen. It's reminiscent of Old Testament Israel. The, da the deck was stacked against them. It was, was not going to happen. And the case is true spiritually for Paul's Israel in Paul's day. They failed to realize what the Gentiles understood from the start. I've already broken the law. Therefore, I can't attain perfection. I'm already stained. I'm already stamped as imperfect. Any chasing after perfection is an exercise in futility because I've already been deemed imperfect. I'm not going to chase something I can't catch. Start looking like Rocky chasing the chicken when he's too close to chase the chicken training for his boxing match. He, he, you'll never catch it. Paul's advice is just stop chasing. Stop working. Stop wasting your time. But if you stop doing that, what do you do? You start trusting. Number two, you start trusting. Verse 32, he says, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as it were, based on works. Let me tell you the problem with the Jewish nation then as well as today. The Jewish nation has redefined the term righteousness. These whole religions are built off semantics. They're built off redefinition of words. To them, the Jewish people, then in Paul's day as well as today, righteousness meant a pattern of doing good. In other words, if I can do more good deeds than, than bad deeds, then I am righteous. And if you follow it out logically, it only takes one more to tilt the scale. If I can do one more good deed than the amount of evil deeds, then I'm righteous. To God, righteousness is defined as something totally different. It's not a pattern of doing good. It's perfection in doing good. And one blemish, one single mistake constitutes imperfection. <clears throat> Way back from childhood or into adulthood, one Single sin constitutes imperfection. And it's even worse than that when we've read Romans in its entirety. Perfection was an imperfection was inherited. It was not even a deed. It's a condition. It's all or nothing with God. You must refrain from breaking any law as well as completely fulfill all laws or you are not righteous and only one person was capable of doing that and it was the Lord Jesus Christ because he did not inherit the sin seed from his father Adam. He was born of a virgin and conceived.
conceived of the Holy Ghost. He's the only person. You can't do it. Even if you could do it, you still have a sin nature that must be dealt with. Someone may ask, just by way of, uh, let's bring this ancient matter into real life for a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll make fun of myself. righteousness so repulsive to God. I mean, it seems like God would recognize I'm trying to do good, I'm trying to do the right thing. Why is this so such an issue for God to write it over and over in the scripture? Well, I remember being confused about this myself when talking with a friend once about Roman Catholic beliefs. And my comment was, Roman Catholics believe you must accept Christ's sacrifice for sins. So they, they got the right starting point. They got the right foundation. What does it matter if they add good works to it? I mean, they are good works. They're not adding murder and adultery to it. Uh, they're, they're adding that you should do these good things. So what's the big problem with that? It, in fact, isn't that a good thing? I mean, they believe in Christ. It matters significantly in this way. How would you feel if you sacrificed your only innocent son for another person? And that person for which you sacrificed your only innocent son kept trying to improve upon that sacrifice. Because every act that we do that adds to, as the Catholic theology teaches, that, 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 that fulfills our end of the bargain, every one of those acts cries out that Christ's sacrifice was not sufficient. This is how God views works based righteousness. This is why it's such an issue. It infuriates Him. It smacks his son, his innocent, sinless son in the face over and over and over again, which causes God to clench his fists in righteous indignation. Why is works-based righteousness so heinous? It's so heinous because it robs God's innocent, sinless son of his glory. It says to God, your son's sacrifice was not good enough. I must add to what he could not accomplish. And that's heresy. In Judaism or in any other form of religion, Calvin goes so far as to say that such people quote, do in their furious madness carry on war with God himself. Why? Because they're working for something God has already completed for them. They're trying, in effect, to usurp God. Stop working and start trusting. Paul ends with an Old Testament illustration in verse 33. The backdrop, of course, is what we went through, the northern southern kingdom, debacle. But the point is, spiritual destruction is coming, but the one who believes proves himself one of the remnant. And having studied the larger context of Isaiah as we have this morning, we understand that to believe means to trust completely. It's not just a belief that God can or even that God will, but it's a complete trust of the complete person. Stop working. Start trusting. Let me close this way. Some of us, and I'll include myself in this category, some of us inadvertently get caught up in perfectionism. That everyday burden of trying to please God perfectly all the time, every hour of every day. And it becomes a checklist, and in some cases an obsession. I've got 
got to do my devotion as soon as I wake up because the Bible says early in the morning I will seek thee and I need to go to church and I need to serve the church and I need to share the gospel with at least five people today, not, not four. Uh, if I get six, then that's cherry on the top, but at least five. Uh, I can't look at this. I, I can't read this material. I can't look at that screen. I need to do this. I need to do these things. And oh, oh, at the end of the day, when I'm ready to finally go to bed because I'm exhausted from my checklist, I realize that the sweet hour of prayer I had neglected. And it's 11.30 at night. I don't have an hour left. Now I fail. How could God still love No, God is perfectly pleased with you already because Christ has accomplished your sweet hour of prayer for you as well as all that God desires of you and he's applied it to you. Now, the sweet hour of prayer is important but not in order to please God. He's already perfectly pleased. Your only obligation is to rest in that grace and then live from the overflow of it so that the sweet hour of prayer is not a kill joy. It is your joy. That's the joy of your salvation. The pressure is off. And now the good works that David Dupree read from in Ephesians 2, verse 10, the good works that God prepared beforehand, you can walk through them with grace, with confidence, with joy, as the happiest person on the, in the world, the happiest person on earth. And I don't have to look at Christians anymore who have frowns on their faces. You shouldn't. Because Christ has accomplished all things for you and has given you the ability to go out and live them out. That is a righteousness that is my faith. So here's what I want to ask you to do. This is the last thing that I'll say. This is easy. I want to ask you to go out and have a nice lunch today. I don't want you to worry about your spiritual checklist. I don't want you to worry about any of those things. I want you to enjoy the freedom that Christ has provided for you. Take a deep breath. Take the afternoon. Rest in His grace. Get a good night's sleep. And when you wake up in the morning,